Uh, Sister Foster, you're a voice crying in the wilderness. I'm going to wait until more people are ready. Ready now? You sure? All right. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you, my brothers and sisters. We greet you in the name of the Lord. Um, those who are visiting with us, we want to greet you in a special way. Thank you so much for coming. If this is your first time, we welcome you to the Scouts Association where we have our Bible studies on Thursday. And to those who are joining us via live stream, we're very happy that you're here sharing with us. We are studying the book of Ephesians. I almost said first Ephesians, but Ephesians under the overarching theme, the sovereign God and the mystery of his will. We're on lesson 25 and we have a pretty involved subject this evening, Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, godless. That's what we were. And we are reading Ephesians 2, 8 to 22. And we are going to ask if you would help us to read. We're going to read responsively. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. For he is our peace. When we come to that, we want to show that peace is not an abstract thing. He is our peace. We're looking for peace maybe in all the wrong areas. We're looking for a political solution, but he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, 
and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Together, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Lord, please direct our hearts as we look into your word. May you give us clarity of thought and of speech. Open our understanding so that we may understand the scriptures. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. In the first half of Ephesians chapter 2, the first half would include verses 1 to 10. In that section, Paul addressed the matter of the salvation of sinners in general. In the second half, the latter half, verses 11 to 22, he addresses himself to the Gentiles in particular. He focuses on the work of Christ for the Gentiles and on the reconciliation of the Gentiles and the Jews in their union with Christ. He wants us, let me say us, to understand that in the purpose and plan of God, both Jews and Gentiles have been brought together and made one in Christ. And we must understand that to us who are here today, what the Lord would be saying to us is that in his purpose and plan, all of us have been brought together and made one in Christ. One in Christ. So in verses 11 to 22, Paul explains that those who have been saved by the grace of God have become part of one body or a single family. The gospel, he says, extends to both Jews and Gentiles, and it extends hope, it extends promise, and it extends a relationship with God and each other. And each other. We must never forget that. When Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment in the law? He gave two. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He was not asked for the two premier commandments in the law. But he is saying to us in effect, the only way that you can give convincing evidence that you love the Lord with all your heart is to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love your neighbor as yourself, don't even try to tell God that you love him with all your heart. Because the proof of loving God with all your heart is loving a neighbor. So, so when God brings us into the church, we're not here individually trying to work our way to God. Brethren, we need to bring that kind of thinking to an abrupt end. We are placed in the body of Christ so that we together can live for God and grow into a holy temple. 
Now, why Paul in this latter section kind of zeroes in on the Gentile members was because most of the church in Ephesus was comprised of Gentile believers. There were some Jews, but the majority of the people were Gentiles. And so he's saying to the Gentiles, look, if this is to work, you're going to have to play a part. Because there has been a long history of antagonism. And now that you are saved, you might be tempted to say, now we are on equal footing in the church. We are going to show you a thing or two. Because we outnumber you. Paul knew that if Christianity was to impact the world in any significant way, it was critical that the Jews and the Gentiles who had accepted Christ, it was critical for them now to live together in love and unity in one body, the church. Paul wanted to witness in the church of Ephesus the realization of God's purpose and plan. He wanted to see it lived out this purpose and plan of God that the Jewish and Gentile believers having been first reconciled to God through faith in Christ Jesus would now be reconciled to each other also in light of the fact that they were all members of one body. And there is Brethren, it doesn't matter how beautifully your choir sings. It doesn't matter how you extend yourself to minister to the poor and the needy. It doesn't matter how eloquent and anointed the ministers in the church are. It doesn't matter how many schools you have and daycare centers and um, old age homes. There is never a more powerful witness of a transformed life than the persons who are members of the church loving each other and living in unity. All these ministries that, you know, we would like to start and so mean nothing if we can't minister to each other in a loving way. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not if you start extension Sunday schools. Not if you have uh, food for the poor feeding situation over here not if you have soup kitchen here if you love one another as i have loved you if you do nothing else if you do that alone people will know that you are the church in first corinthians 12 verses 12 to 26 paul addressed this matter directly. He looked at the fact that the individual members of the church have been incorporated into one body. He says, for just as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so too is Christ. It's almost as if Paul is saying, Christ is not complete without his body. That's a very interesting thought. He says, so too is Christ, as if Christ needs us. Do you realize do you realize we sing songs, beautiful songs, 
you know, someone to care, someone to share all our, what is it, problems, our burdens, like no other can do. He'll come down from the sky, wipe a tear from your eye. You're his child and he cares for you. You're hardly going to find Jesus coming down from the sky to wipe a tear from your eye. He's going to wipe a tear from your eye through a brother or sister who loves you. It is we who are the hands and feet of Christ. We are his body. He is the head. If some people in the church are ever going to be ministered unto by Christ, it is going to be through us. Don't wait for Jesus to come down and brush a tear from your eye. If Jesus were ever to come by your bedside, well, maybe he should, because if you were sick and you saw Jesus, you'd get up at the same time. Maybe you'll run from the bed too. No, it is in our ministering to each other that Jesus is seen in the church. Amen. That's why Paul makes such a big to do about the Lord's Supper. And when he says that we get into trouble, we are weak and we are sickly and even sleep, he says, because we don't discern the Lord's body. That is more than just the emblems of his body and blood. We don't discern the Lord's body. Who is the Lord's body? If I have not been treating you good, I better be careful how I come to the Lord's Supper. See, while you are fasting and praying to get sin out of your life and trying to make sure that you're dressed properly to come, Give more attention to how you have been treating people. Maybe before you eat, you need to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry for the way I spoke to you this morning. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, we are all made to drink of the one spirit. For in fact, the body is not a single member, but many. If the foot says, since I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it does not lose its membership in the body because of that. And if the ear says, since I am not an eye, I am not part of the body. It does not lose its membership in the body because of that. If the whole body were an eye, what part would do the hearing? You see that, brethren? Somebody told me, when was it? Somebody told me recently, was it on Sunday? Yes, it was on Sunday morning. When I first arrived at church, somebody was speaking to me and the person was saying that they were visiting a church where there are more elders than saints. More chiefs than Indians. More pastors than saints. If the whole were an ear, what part would exercise the sense of smell? You see what we are saying, brethren? You understand what we are saying? But as a matter of fact, God 
has placed each of the members in the body just as he decided. Just as he decided. He decided to place the heart here and the kidney down here. He decided. And because God has decided, there, as far as I know, are no success stories of anybody putting a kidney up here and a heart down here. You understand that that has implications for the church. When we are in the wrong position in the body, the body suffers. Everybody can't be a preacher. Everybody can't be an usher or a greeter. Everybody can't be a singer. If you don't have a good singing voice, that is not your ministry. It is not my ministry. I would like it to be. I earnestly wish that I could sing. And people have told me that I have improved over the years. So you know, when I started, it was bad. If they were all the same member, where would the body be? Think about it. Think about it. If the body was just comprised of a heart and nothing else, that would probably be a powerful heart. But where would it go? Who would take it anywhere? How would it think? It would be just a big pump. But where would the blood go? Where would be the veins that would carry the blood? That heart wouldn't live for a day by itself. No matter how powerful it was. And no matter how powerful I am, or you think you are, or we think we are, we will not last long without each other. You can't sit at home and go to church, folks. You can stay at home and say you are in church. The eye cannot say to the hand, oh, sorry, verse 20. So now there are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. Nor in turn can the Head say to the foot, I do not need you. Here's something we probably don't like to contemplate. On the contrary, those members that seem to be weaker are essential. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. And those members we consider less honorable. We clothe with greater honor and our unrepresentable members are clothed with dignity there are some members of the body that God has hidden away they are not exposed but that doesn't mean they are not important some of the members that are hidden away are more important than some that are exposed. But our presentable members do not need this. Instead, God has blended together the body, giving greater honor to the lesser member
Anybody in here think you are a big member of the Grace Workshop? Why does God do that? So that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have mutual concern for one another. If one member suffers, everyone suffers with it. If a member is honored, all rejoice with it. We wouldn't have to go much further in our Bible study to understand that we have a lot to pray about. A lot to ask God to help us with because we are far away from this. And we're not going to pretend like we are even close. Maybe we are closer than we used to be, but still not close enough. See, what we would rather have is a ministry to take care of this. What we want is for somebody to be employed full time who will make sure to call everybody who was absent last Sunday while we kick back. Do you think in a church like this, one person is going to be able to call everybody who was not here? And who is the person who is going to call? Does that person sit beside the person week in, week out? Wouldn't it be very effective if you and I who sit close to the person would call or better yet go and find out what is happening? So we want a ministry to solve every problem. Every little thing that comes up, let's establish a committee to deal with it. Because we really don't care for the body. Do you remember that Joseph of Arimathea, who was apparently a member of the Sanhedrin Council, went to Pontius Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. And when he begged for the body of Jesus, the body of Jesus was in a horrible state. I hear a lot of talk about those who love the church. Love the church. They love the church, but they want to be in a perfect church. You don't love the church. You don't know anything about the church. The church will never be perfect. Not down here. When Joseph begged for the body of Jesus, it didn't even look like a human body. You have to learn to love the body with all its faults, with all its scars, with all its bruises, with all its faults. If you really love the body, There's a message that I have been trying to preach for a couple of weeks now. I've asked you to send me some old garbage and some of you have responded and I'm so grateful, but 
I have not been allowed to preach that message yet. I thought I was ready. But when I do, I'll tell you about a church administrator who, a young man, and he had occasion to go to his pastor. And he said to his pastor, he said, Pastor, there is no doubt that we give a lot of trouble. There is no doubt that we need scolding. There is no doubt that we need a lot of warnings and instructions. But pastor, it would help from time to time if you just demonstrated to us that you love us. When I heard that I wanted to quit, I said, Lord, this is too great for me. This is too great for me. Body of Christ. See, we want to be in a church and never have to work hard and never have to be rubbed the wrong way. We want to be in a church where everybody smells of lavender because every true believer in Christ has received the gift of the Holy Spirit every true believer is a member of the body of Christ race social status wealth our gender are neither advantages or handicaps as we fellowship and serve the Lord. In Ephesians 2 verses 11 to 12, this is what Paul writes. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time ye were without Christ Paul says I don't want you Gentiles to forget there was a time when you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world he starts with the word wherefore and that word wherefore at the beginning of the passage indicates that what is going to follow is a personal and ethical application of what has been said previously in verses 1 to 10 in verses 1 to 10 he wrote to them about the great things that God had accomplished for them especially for the Gentiles, by way of his grace. And he says to them, I have outlined all of these things to you with the hope that when you remember that you were dead and disobedient and depraved and doomed, you will call to mind the state from which God raised you. And an overwhelming sense of gratitude will be awakened in your heart when you look at your privileged state now, seated in heavenly places in Christ, when once you had no hope when once you were a dog and a sorcerer and a whoremonger. No, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. No, you can sing, oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the King. 
his royal blood now flows through my veins and all wretched John Mark who was vile now can sing praise God praise God I'm a child of the king When I remember that, I just want to live for him and to please him and to do the good works that he has ordained for me to do. This is what Paul is saying to them in effect. In effect he's saying, listen you Gentiles, I want you to always consider your present exalted position in the light of your former low estate so that you will never forget to glorify the God who saved you. Remember that before you were saved, your case was in a sense even more hopeless than that of the unsaved Jews. For you were Gentiles. You carried the evidence of your estrangement in your very flesh, for you were not circumcised. The unsaved Jews contemptuously call you the uncircumcised. They do this even though they who refer to themselves as the circumcised possess only the sign of circumcision in the flesh, not the reality of circumcision of the heart. Their circumcision was outward, not inward. Of course, the real meaning or value of circumcision has been erased with Christ's death on the cross. Yet, in this outward mark, the Jews continue to glory while they despise all others, including you, you Ephesians. Paul lists five things that were true of these uncircumcised Gentiles before the grace of God intervened in their lives. These five things clearly indicate how desperate and miserable their condition was. The word that best describes their pre-conversion state is the word without. They were without Christ, without citizenship, without covenants, without hope, and without God. In other words, they were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. The first is that they were without Christ. Without Christ. They were without Christ. The former condition of these Gentiles in Ephesus was one in which they had no connection with Christ. They were accustomed in Ephesus to worship the goddess Diana, and before hearing the gospel, they knew nothing about Christ. They believed that that statue of Diana was a very imposing and impressive statue. They believe it fell down from heaven to the earth, you know. That's what they believed. That's the God that they worshipped. Now, in this respect, they were greatly inferior to the Jews. Their position was greatly inferior to the Jews because the Jews always had a messianic hope. They were always looking for Christ. From the very time they opened their Bible and saw the first messianic promise, the seed of the woman, shall bruise the seed of the serpent. When Cain was born, Adam and Eve thought Cain was the one. So they always lived in hope of their Messiah coming, which is why it is so tragic that when he came, I was going to say they did not recognize him, but they did. They rejected him because he was not the Messiah that they wanted him to be. 
And if we are not careful, we will reject Jesus in a sense because he's not the Messiah that we want him to be. You see, we want a Messiah that will give us a husband on demand and a wife on demand and a car on demand and a house on demand and heal us on demand and give us what we want when we snap our fingers. Anyhow, that's not my burden tonight. It is important for us to understand that when Paul speaks of the Gentiles as being without Christ, he was not saying that before their conversion, Christ had had no interest in them. He was not saying that before they were saved, Christ had paid no attention to them. Because we know from chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, that they had been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We know that they had been predestinated to be holy and blameless. That had happened. So it, it is not that Jesus didn't know them. It's the fact that they didn't know anything about him at all. What Paul is saying is that before their conversion, before this conversion, they, they, they just had not experienced Christ in any sense whatever. And they didn't even have an expectation of Christ. They didn't even have a thought that there was a Christ who was to come. At least the Jews had that. The Gentiles didn't have that. They were, they were it's not that they were without Christ as Savior. But they had no covenant connection with him at all. None. Just none. You can imagine the situation. They, they, well, they didn't know. Paul is saying to them, you didn't even know. You didn't know how lost you were. Isn't that the same with us? These Gentiles had been groping in the darkness, filth, and despair of sin without any knowledge of how lost they were. Thus, their form, in their former state, they had been unspeakably wretched. To be lost and not know that you are lost is terrible. Their being without Christ, their lack of all relation to him, was the first indication of the dark picture of their former heathen life. And all the other withouts that come after this, all of them result from this first one, you are without Christ. So if you are without Christ, you are without everything else. Because if you don't know the Son, you can't know the Father. Because it is the Father that has to introduce you to the... It is the Son that has to introduce you to the Father. You can't know God unless you know Jesus. So if you don't have Christ, you have nothing at all. In considering this, let us keep in mind that every unsaved person, Jew or Gentile, is in a sense without Christ. And to remain in such a state means eternal condemnation. So I would like to use this opportunity tonight to appeal to anybody who is here who is without Christ. I want to appeal to you. You are in a very dangerous position. Please come to Christ. Please come to Christ. Before they were saved, the Ephesian Gentiles had been Christless, and so were we. Don't, don't lose that. We're not talking about an abstract situation. So were we. The second thing is that they were without citizenship. Paul says that they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. 
this phrase expresses the idea of being a stranger as contrasted with one who is at home with a person or an object. The word commonwealth is the translation of a Greek word which has two main senses. Firstly, a state or commonwealth and secondly, citizenship or the rights of a citizen. I am of the view that Paul uses the word here in both senses. The Ephesians had no part in the theocracy, which was the Old Testament constitution under which God made himself known to the Jews and entered into relations with him or her. This is how this, this was the theocracy. It was God rule. God apparently never thought of operating a democracy. Even under the kings, it was a theocracy because the king ruled at the pleasure of God. It was a theocracy. God ruled through the king. And it was God who set them up and God who pulled them down. But, but the, 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 the Gentiles had no idea of this. They had no part in the theocracy. And since they had no part in it, they had no citizenship. They had no rights of a citizen in what was known as the Israel of God. Now, they were not stateless in every sense of the word because they were part of the Roman province of Asia. So they were not stateless stateless in every conceivable way but they were excluded from the many blessings that pertained to the Jewish theocracy they lacked citizenship among the chosen people have you ever been in an environment where it was made very clear to you that you were not a citizen Persons who travel have an understanding of this. Sometimes you go to the airport and it is pointed out to you very clearly. If you are a citizen here, visit at there. And the citizens always seem to get through quickly. And we understand that. It is how they feel when they come here. It's not a nice thing. So, brethren, do you, do you, none of us here, well, I don't think many of us have a sense of how a refugee feels who flees from one country uh, and the country that he or she flees to is not even willing to accept them. Stateless. They don't have any rights. It's terrible. I went to a church once, somewhere in the world, and there was a lady there, precious lady. She had come to that country from somewhere else in the world. And after the service, she came up to me and she said to me, in my country, I was a professor. I had a split level house and a swimming pool. But she said, I left to come to this country because I wanted to get away from all the rules. It was a Muslim country. She said, I just couldn't continue living that way. And she said, now I am here and I'm barely surviving. But I would not give it up because I have met Jesus. And she introduced me to a young man and she said, he came up 
a few weeks ago and he is going to be baptized next week and I have told him any church he goes where they have a lot of rules do not go there I could not leave a situation and come back into a situation like that. And she says, if this church does that, I am gone. Because there is freedom in Jesus. She understands it's not freedom to do what she wants. But it's freedom to do what he wants and not what a man wants. Because in many churches, it is not what God wants. It is what a man or a woman wants. If you don't like it, still swallow it. Because we're not backing down. We're going to serve it hot, cold, liquid, every way. It's not nice to, be, to not be a citizen. It was a deplorable luck. Because you see, it was to Israel that God had revealed himself. In fact, in Amos chapter 2, I think he said, there's no other nation that I have known. You are the only nation that I have known. To Israel, he had given his law, his special protection, his prophecies, his promises. And Paul highlighted the special relationship that existed between God and the nation of Israel in Romans 9, 4 to 5. He refers to his fellow countrymen in the following way. He says, who are Israelites. To them belong the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from them by human descent came the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. He says, all of this is the inheritance of Israel. And sometimes I ask myself, how could so much come to so little? Before they were saved, the Ephesian Gentiles had been stateless. And so were we. We had no citizenship. We are it really matters. I'm proud to be a Jamaican. Still proud to be a Jamaican. But, um, brethren, I must tell you that um, if I were not a citizen of heaven, being a citizen of Jamaica would be worthless to me. I'm serious and I'm not. It would be worthless to me. The only thing that makes me want to live is Jesus. I don't have anything else living for. And it's not because I'm a pastor. I know that if I were not the pastor of this church or a pastor anywhere, then yes, I might have to find a secular job and work. But I could work and I believe still be happy as long as I had Christ. But anytime Christ is no longer part of the equation, tell the world John Mark Bartlett will be of no use to anybody for nothing. The third thing that was true of these uncircumcised Gentiles before they were saved was that they were without covenants. Paul says that they were strangers from the covenants of promise. The definite article is in the Greek text. It is strangers from the covenants of the promise. The word strangers is a translation of a Greek word which has the particular meaning of one who is not a member of a state or city. And we just spoke about that. It is used here in a general sense of being foreign to a thing, having no share in it. The covenants of promise that are referred to are the covenants 
that God entered into with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these have to do with the messianic significance, the, the, the promise of the Messiah, the, the promise of salvation. Gentiles were without that. They were without that. To this covenant, the Ephesians in their lost condition had been strangers. While it is true that the blessing of the Gentiles was included in God's covenant with Abraham, according to Genesis 12, 1 to 3, but God did not make any covenants with the Gentile nations. At that time, God had never revealed himself to them as their special friend. And now, by this time, the Jews had robbed God's covenant of its real spiritual meaning. We have dealt with that in the, the last two Sundays. And had substituted for this, this, this wonderful promise just the hope of earthly glory. Since they had done that, they had not even been able to convey to the Gentiles the glory of God's promise. God did not raise up the Jews and reveal himself to them for their benefit only. You know. They were to be the channels through which the Gentile world would make him known. But the Jewish nation, they are pictured perfectly in Jonah. Just didn't want. And I've heard people say, well, you know, the Ninevites were a wicked nation. And that's why Jonah didn't want to go. He was scared. That is so untrue. The text tells us. Jonah says it to God in anger. He says, this is why I did not want to come. Because I know you are a loving God. You are very merciful. I know. You, if these people repented, you would have forgiven them. And he's saying, they deserve to die. They are so wicked. And what about you, Jonah? Are you not a sinner? You don't deserve to die. Brethren, listen. When Abraham stood before God and was pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, will you destroy the city if you can find 50 righteous? And God said, no, I will not. 45? No, I will not. 40? No, I will not. 30? No, I will not. 20? No, I will not. 10? No, I will not. Anything? You're not going down no further. If he had gone down to one, a righteous person is a person who God says is righteous. There would be no righteous persons in Sodom. Go down to as low as you want. Some time ago, some, a gentleman wrote a book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And there have been many books like that. Well, not many, but other books following up on that. There has never been a bad thing that has happened to a good person. Because there are no good persons. No bad things happen to good people. Because there is none good save one and that is God. Jesus himself said that. And no bad things happen to Christian people either. Because all things come from the hand of God. And God does not know how to do badly. The thing seems to be bad. It appears to be bad. It feels bad. 
We cry as we should. We are crushed as we should. We are heartbroken as we should. But all things work together for good. God has sent it for our good. And he makes no mistakes. But the problem with us is that we have lived so long with the Santa Claus God. Job had more sense than us. Job had more sense than us. Job said to his wife, we have received good at the hands of God. Shall we not receive evil? Evil is not necessarily bad, you know. It's not the time for that, though. We'll talk about that one day. Ah, oh, Jesus, help us. Help us. Help us, the Grace Workshop, not to fail to convey your goodness to persons who are on the outside. Help us not to be so righteous in ourselves and to think that the thing belongs to us that we fail to understand that one of the main reasons why you have dug us out of the pit is so that we can tell our story to other pit people Listen to what God says to them. We have been over this. Matthew 23, 13 to 15. But woe to you experts in the law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You keep locking people out of the kingdom of heaven. Oh my God. That's serious, you know, folks. These were the religious people. These were the guardians, you know. These were the persons who were supposed to open the door. You keep locking people out for you neither enter nor permit those trying to enter to go in. Woe to you experts in the law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You cross land and sea to make one convert. And when you get one, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Before they were saved, the Ephesian Gentiles had been friendless. And so were we. Because if God is not your friend, which friend do you really have? <laughs> My grandmother used to sing a song I remember. You know, years ago, there's a friend for little children above the bright blue sky. A friend who never changes, whose love will never die. Our earthly friends will fail us and change with changing years. That friend is always worthy, the precious name he bears. Friendless, friendless, friendless. The fourth thing was that they were without hope. People who are without hope commit suicide. Some of us have been there. Don't put your hands up. I know it. Some of us have been there. Paul refers to them as having no hope. This follows very naturally. For the hope of the Christian is based on the divine promise. And since, as we have just seen, the Gentiles were strangers from the covenants of promise, they lacked any assurance of salvation. Such hope is one of God's most precious gifts. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, hope is mentioned together with faith and love as one of the three things that will endure. Now abideth faith hope and charity, these three. Hope, listen to me, this is a very important part of our lesson. Hope is a knowledge of God's promise coupled with a confidence 
that his promise will be fulfilled. All of us need to know the promise of God. And we need to believe the promise of God. Because that is where we get hope. And we need hope in this kind of world that we are living in. It is the conviction that all things will be well. Even when all things seem to be going wrong. Hope never fails. It never disappoints. Because like faith and love, it is a divine gift. In Romans 5 verse 5, Paul writes, And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the love of God communicates to us so powerfully this love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost causes us to understand how much God loves us and gives us hope. In their lost condition, the Gentiles in Ephesus had lacked this hope. Think about it. Not only were they devoid of the messianic hope, which was one of the distinctions of the Jews. They, they, they weren't looking for Christ to come. But more than that, they were utterly without any hope whatsoever. They were completely ignorant of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offered. And so they had nothing to hope for beyond this world. Instead, they had been filled with fear and despair. Brethren, Almost every time I pray, I say to the Lord, Lord, perhaps you're not. I don't say this every time, but sometimes I say, Lord, I want to explain my situation to you because maybe you don't fully understand. <laughs> Serious, I say, Lord, I, I, you are my only hope only. only hope my expectation is of you I said you understand what that means Lord that means that without you life is just empty and barren and meaningless for me so I cannot function I don't know about anybody else in the church they have to pray for themselves I cannot function without you. If I had not known you, then I would be all right. But you caused me to know you. Ah, Jesus. Before they were saved, the Ephesian Gentiles had been hopeless. And so were we. So were we. No hope. The fifth thing Paul lists as being true of these uncircumcised Gentiles before they encountered God's grace was that they were without God. Paul informs us that they were without God in the world. It was not that they did not worship any gods prior to their conversion. We have said earlier that they used to worship the goddess Diana, but they were without the knowledge of the true God and without the knowledge of the one true and living God. They were in reality destitute of any God because I know God is not a God. Brethren, do you understand how gracious God God has been to us to reveal himself to us. Do you understand how precious is his calling on your life? Do you remember when the, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines? When it was captured by the Philistines, they set it up. 
in the temple of Dagon, their God. And when they came the next morning, Dagon had fallen down before Yahweh. So they said, Dagon had an accident. So they put Dagon up back. And the next morning when they came, Dagon was smashed into a million pieces. And they started now to get diseases. And there was a rat infestation. So they sent it to the other Philistine city. The same thing happened. They sent it, so they sent it to all five Philistine cities. And they got together and said, we cannot continue like this. We, the, it, it seemed like the God of Israel is, is upset with us. What will we do? The priest said, all right. What we're going to do? We are going to fashion some gold rats and some gold emeralds. And we're going to put the, them with the ark on a cart. And we are going to attach to the cart to two milking cows. Two milking cows, you know. The King James said M-I-L-C-H. But it's not milch. It's milk. So what, what they wanted to do now, they said, if, if, the cows pull this straight to Israel, we will know that it is God. But if, it, if, if, if the cows turn aside to the right or to the left, we will know that it wasn't God that did it. It was just by chance. You, you see, all the proof they had earlier, they still didn't believe. So what is God to do for them? That's why I'm telling you, when we... Faith comes into our heart and we believe God and we believe Jesus. It's a wonderful thing that didn't come from us. Why do you think they used two milk cows? Because they had young. They had calves. And they were stacking the deck against God. They were saying, if Cows have calves. They're not going to carry this all the way to Israel. They're going to turn aside to go back to their calves. So they sent them. And they were walking behind it. Some of them, the lords, were walking behind the cart. And the Bible says the, 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 the cows went straight along the road. Lowing as they went. When a cow is lowing, it is protesting. The cows were saying, we don't want to go, but there's a force. We want to turn back to our calves. Lowing is not a pleasant sound that cows make. They were crying, but something was leading them irresistibly till they, till they came, and when they came to Beth Shemesh, they stopped. The Philistines saw all that and still didn't believe. Some miraculous signs and all that will not convince somebody to believe unless God puts faith in their heart. So I'm saying to us brethren, if we believe God tonight, it is a gift of God that we should thank him for every day. You understand the salvation that is yours? When Paul says it is a gift of God, he's serious. You don't want no more proof than that. They stack the deck against, it, against Yahweh. And the cows still went. Milk cows. They never even used bulls that really don't care. They use milk cows that have young calves. And the cows went lowing as they went. don't have no knowledge of God. They didn't have any knowledge of God. 
In Galatians 4.8, Paul writes the following to the Christians in Galatia. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that by nature are no gods at all. Like the Galatians, the Gentile Ephesians had served and worshipped gods who were powerless. They were in truth without God in the world. How so? In the sense that they had been without the true knowledge of God and therefore without holiness, righteousness, peace, and the joy of salvation. Brethren, let me tell you, and this, this sounds, it sounds arrogant, like arrogance, but it's biblical truth. There is not one man in the, on the face of this earth that does not know there is a God. Some of them are honest and some are not. I think it was Huxley who said, I don't believe in God because the implications of God are too painful for the life that I am living. It is easier for me to believe that there is no God. Let, let me show you something in the book of Romans. Some of you doubt what I'm saying. Who has said in his heart that there is no God? Fool. Fool. Romans 1 verse 18, Paul says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, that means to hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Listen to this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. This is not, this is God's assessment. This is not Bartlett's assessment. I have said that it is not true. God says all of them are without excuse. I have given them enough for every one of them to know that there is a God. This is the true light that lighted every man that cometh into the world. And brethren, hear me. Hear me. Man was made to worship. And if he doesn't worship God, the true God, he's going to worship a God. He's going to, and, and, and I told you on Sunday that John Calvin said, the heart of man is an idol factory. We manufacture idols. And one of the biggest idols that we manufacture is ourselves. Many of us, well, some of us, have become the God of our own idolatry. We have to worship something. We have to worship a God. Who is your God tonight? Before you say Jesus, think about it. Before you say Jesus, think about it. Think about it. Who is who? Is, who is your God? Who do you, who do you, who, who do you cater to? There, there's a powerful statement that I found in Baker New Testament commentary. It, I, I hope it will affect you as it affects me. In commenting on the Gentiles being without God in the world, the commentary makes this observation. They had resembled mariners, sailors, who without compass and guide were adrift in a rudderless ship during a starless night on a tempestuous
tempestuous sea far away from the harbor. So he's saying, being without God, he's saying, let me give you an example of what that is like. That is like sailors who don't have no compass, no navigational tools at all. And they are adrift at sea. They are lost at sea. They don't have no compass and no guide. Their ship has no rudder. That means that even if they had a compass or a guide, they couldn't steer it in the direction that they want. They are in a, it's a starless night. So they can't look up and say, oh, the, based on how the stars are aligned, we are heading east, west, north, or south. And the sea is tempestuous. And they are far from any harbor. What a condition to be in. Don't laugh at people who don't know Jesus. Don't make a mockery of them. Cry for them. Cry for them. Cry for them. Pray for them. Try to tell them about Jesus. It's not a joke, brethren. It's not a joke. We must cheer. We need to cry. Songs that rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Don't tell them about the grace workshop ministries. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Before they were saved, the Ephesian Gentiles had been godless, and so were we. In Ephesians 2, 11 to 12, Paul reminds us of the condition in which we walked as unbelieving members of this world. He tells us that we were separated from each other. We were at animosity with each other. All of these damaged relationships are the result of sin. If Paul was writing today about the Jamaican context, he would have written about the haves versus the have-nots. Inner city residents versus uptowners. Brownings versus blacklings. Comrades versus laborites. Or even church denomination versus church denomination. Not just Jew and Gentile. We have holy more that divide us. But I want to raise my hand in the Scouts Association and say, so help me God, we're going to mash down the barriers. So help me God. Or I'm going to die trying. And I know it's going to take time. I only look foolish. I'm not that foolish. The Grace Workshop Ministry should be a place where the deepest divisions are dealt with in Jesus Christ. A place where loving confrontation is used to resolve conflicts. What does that mean? That means if you heard, if Brother Wilson hears that Brother Peter says something about him, He's not going to go to Sister Jackie and say, I hear that Brother Peter says something about me. I mean, always know him not like me, you know. What he's going to do, he's going to go and say, come here, Uncle P. I hear something. I don't believe that you would say a thing like that. But I just want to clear the ear. How it go? Sister Jackie tell me so. I had, a, I, had a, I had a general manager at a place where I used to work. He was a unique man. So sometimes, you would go to him and say, Mr. So-and-so, you know that Cheryl said this about you? And he would say, true. Stay here a little bit. And he'd dial and say, Cheryl, come here. 
John, so you said that about me. No news never got to him after that. The Grace Workshop should be a place where we fellowship our differences, not quarrel about our differences. Fellowship our differences. I don't see it exactly the same way, but that cannot stop me from loving you and fellowshipping with you. The only way that these things can happen is if the gospel of grace is preached, taught, understood, believed, and applied. And applied to every area of our lives. So don't just bask in the fact that God has shown you grace as a sinner. Show me grace too. When I sin against you. You can't just be receiving grace. Show grace too. Let's stand. Lord Jesus. Once again. We stand in your presence. Lord I want to thank you for a long-suffering set of people who listen to me every, when, every Thursday night. I come and I ramble, and they are so patient. I thank you for them, Lord. Sometimes I keep them longer than I want, but they still sit there. And it's not because they love to hear me, but it's because they love you and they love your word. Lord, Teach us, because we have to change. We have to transition, and we have to steadily allow you to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. We are moving away, slowly but surely, from being content to have a good feeling in church. We're moving away slowly but surely from relying on a good feeling. We're, we're, we're moving to a place where we can be doctrinally sound. Where we don't have to feel forgiven to know we are forgiven. Where, where even when the devil whispers condemnation to us, we know that there is no condemnation. And we want to transition to be an assembly where we love each other and live in unity and all the barriers are broken down. All the barriers are broken down. No big I and little you. Just little all of us. Little all of us. Help us, Lord. It's, it's change is not easy. Change is not easy. And, and some of us really do not want to give up our old way of thinking and living. We, we want to cling the easy way. But you are taking us into deep water. And there are no rails to hold on to. Either sink or swim. And as long as you stay on us, we'll never sink. So, so help us, Lord, to, to realize that there's nothing to hold on to. There's no life raft except Jesus. So, so the things that we use to use to define ourselves as Christians, those things are no more. The Bible and only the Bible is now the mark. Deep water. Deep water. 
Not the externals, but the internals. And when the internals are right, it's not possible for the externals not to be right. Help us as a church, Lord. Continue to love us and be patient with us. And take us where you want us to go. We commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name. Come with an offering, brethren, please.